Thank you for joining us and welcome to today's webinar, Honoring Black Women, Remembering Breonna Taylor with Social Justice Research, Activism, and Teaching. My name is Sarah Mancall, and I'm the Policy Director here at the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues, also known as FISI, and we are also known as Division 9 of the American Psychological Association. A few quick logistical points before we get started today. On the screen, you will be able to see and hear from our moderator and our three panelists. Since this is Zoom webinar, all attendees are in view and listen only mode, but that said, we would love to hear from you. So please use your chat box to send questions so that the panelists can answer them today. And if you have any trouble uh, logistics wise, please message me and I'll see what I can do. I would also like to mention that today's webinar is being recorded and we'll be posting it on SPICI's YouTube channel afterward. Please note that only the speaker's video and audio feeds will be posted there. We will not be posting the chat to YouTube. And now on to our presentations for today. Our moderator is Dr. Dion Stevens. She is an associate professor of psychology at Florida International University, where she conducts research that examines socio-historical factors shaping minority population sexual scripting and sexual health processes with an emphasis on gender and ethnic racial identity development. She is also co-chair of SPICI's communications committee and will be moderating today's discussion. Dr. Stevens, the floor is yours. Let me unmute myself. So thank you so much, Sarah, for that kind um, uh, and warm introduction. So I'm so excited about today's webinar because we have some fabulous speakers who I'm so glad we were able to pull together because they come from a really diverse um, group uh, interdisciplinary and also field. So I'm excited to be able to have this presentation. But just for some background, the death of Breonna Taylor, a black medical worker who was shot and killed by Louisville police officers in March during a botched raid on her apartment, led to wide scale demonstrations in this past year and drew a lot of attention to the case. The killing of Miss Taylor in the context of several other murders of black and brown women and men have had a profound impact nationally and globally. When we're thinking specifically in academic spaces, the number of students reaching out to faculty and teachers whose work centers around related social justice issues has skyrocketed. Further, research that's already been focusing on the epidemic of police brutality against black and brown bodies has been gaining traction in wider circles. For example, the unequal punishments handed out to black girls in school systems, the school to prison pipeline, particularly as it affects young black women. All of these types of research have become critically important to consider in the larger context of Ms. Taylor's murder. So it's important for us to consider and critique these outcomes in spaces such as academia and the community where knowledge is being formed, education is being disseminated, and cultural values are being shaped. So um, with other organizations that are trying to maintain efforts to keep saying her name, we've brought together voices that have been addressing these injustices through their research, teaching, and community activism. So Dr. Keisha Thomas, Ms. Lima Campbell, and Dr. Sasha Param, sorry, Panaram, we're going to lead this discussion ex exploring Black women's unique experiences with police brutality, where it occurs, and how to address it. And we're also going to highlight the ways in which police brutality affects Black women's well being and provide solutions for academics and community leaders to develop strategies supporting Black women and the Black Lives Matter over movement overall. So let me first begin by introducing Dr. Uh, Ms. Thema Campbell who's one of the most accomplished and passionate nonprofit leaders in Miami-Dade County. And she's also a leading equity advocate for At Promise Girls and their families. Theme has been honored by numerous organizations for improving academic performance and changing the trajectory of the lives of Miami's disadvantaged children with a concentration on middle and high schools in Liberty City, Little Haiti, Overtown, Brownsville, Richmond Heights and Perrine communities. Theme is also the founding president and CEO for Girl Power, where she's held in high esteem as a community anchoring agency since 2000. She's also a founding member of Equity and Advocacy Collective, a member of Overtown Children and Youth Coalition, the Girls Coalition, and an active member of the Overtown Council for the Community Good. A real Southern belle, Thema's hospitality, good heart, and helping hand came from her early years growing up in Sparta, Georgia, where she was raised in a family of 10 children by loving parents and her grandmother, Mama Haiti. 
Currently, she surrounds herself with positive, like-minded individuals, one of those being her daughter, who works side by side with her at Girl Power, helping to serve, her, serve the community. We also have Dr. Sasha Ann Panoram. Dr. Sasha Ann Panoram is a visiting assistant professor of English at Fordham University, where she specializes in 20th and 21st century African American and Caribbean literature and culture, with a particular interest in girls and gender studies, as well as slavery studies and performance studies. She received her PhD from English at Duke University in 2020, where she also completed certificates in African and African American studies and feminist studies. Prior to Duke, she received her BA in English from Georgetown University. Her research has been published in The Black Scholar and her public scholarship appears in WNYC and Hyperallergetic. Most recently, she published a piece entitled Say Her Name, Seeking Justice for Breonna Taylor on Black Perspectives, the award-winning blog for African-American intellectual history. And I'll be sharing a link with that um, article in the chat in one moment. And finally, we have Dr. Keisha Thomas, who is now the Dean of the University of Alabama's College of Arts and Sciences. Prior to joining the leadership at UAB, Dr. Thomas was a Senior Associate Dean at the Franklin College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Georgia, where she began her career as a professor of industrial organizational psychology and African-American studies. Dr. Thomas is an expert in the psychology of workplace diversity. Her scholarship and institutional engagements, in fact, focus on issues of strategic diversity recruitment, supporting diversity in STEM workplaces, and understanding the career experience of high potential women of color. She's the author of over 60 peer reviewed articles and book chapters, as well as the first IO diversity textbook, Diversity Dynamics in the Workplace. And Dr. Thomas has also conducted applied research for uh, and provided professional development for diverse organizations focusing on launching diversity and inclusion, climate studies, diversity training, design and delivery, facilitation of diversity strategic plans and small group coaching. So clearly we have an excellent group um, of panelists here that are leading today's webinar. And again, I'm going to be um, asking a series of questions for us to lead this discussion, but I encourage you to enter any questions or comments in the chat and I'll be sure to share them with the panelists. So uh, welcome and thank you so much for participating. And I do want to get us started by asking all three of you the question, how do black women's unique experiences with police brutality um, impact your role as academics or community leaders? And particularly, why was Brianna Taylor's experience so salient and impactful for you? And please jump in. Maybe we can begin with Sasha. Sure, and thank you. Before I begin, I wanna say thank you to Dr. Stevens for inviting me to be part of this webinar and for gathering us in this way around this really important topic. I come to you all as a literary scholar, a literary scholar who was trained in black studies and women's and gender studies. And I've been following Breonna Taylor's murder since March. And then again, when it reemerged in public consciousness after George Floyd's killing. And one of the things that initially struck me as something to be particularly concerned about was the way that certain news organizations, not all, but certain news organizations were creating these elaborate narratives that planted seeds of doubt around what actually happened to Breonna Taylor. And I don't mean to suggest in any way that we knew everything we needed to know at the start. However, you know, I, to, to qualify that, I think there were reasons that we should be asking, did the police have a warrant or not? I think there were reasons to be asking when this got taken to the grand jury level, what type of evidence was being provided to the folks in that process. However, I do think that the decision of certain journalists and certain media organizations to raise more questions than to go after committing going after the truth, I think really took us away from what it is that we do know about what happened, which is that a set of officers, some who had previous misdemeanors, went in and used excessive force to kill Breonna Taylor. And as someone who enters into this conversation with the conviction that stories matter, how we tell them, who tells them, what we do with them, for me, Breonna Taylor's murder made me go after more accurate, accurate sources that were providing a way to better understand both her life and her death. 
And I do think that there were places that we can go to look for that information. So at one point I was going to the Courier Journal, the local newspaper in, in Kentucky that was doing fabulous in investigative reporting where they were pulling together sources. You know, the blank is incident report, for instance, where they were offering up a totally different narrative of what was happening. Or many of you might've seen The Killing of Breonna Taylor, which was this documentary put together by FX and Hulu and the New York Times. Again, another way to understand how Breonna Taylor was embedded in a community, her, both her family community and also the one that she served. And so the last thing I'll say on this point is, I think we live in a really peculiar moment where facts don't seem to matter anymore. And when I say that, I mean, we have more than ample footage in this year alone of black people being brutalized by the police. And yet we can have robust narratives that suggest otherwise. And so I think it's really important. And again, I come to this conversation as a literary scholar for all of us to go after those stories, especially in a moment like this. Well, that was, I appreciate that, um, what you've said. And we'll come back to some of the things that you've raised there, Dr. Panoram. Um, Ms. Campbell, would you like to maybe comment on what this meant for you? Yes. Uh, also, thank you so much, um, Dr. Stevens, for having me on. And uh, I wanted to extend greetings to Dr. Sasha, Dr. Thomas, and to Sarah, uh, and to say what a pleasure it is to be on this panel. So the, the killing of Breonna Taylor, um, you know, there's two sides to me. There's the, the activist, well, there's more than two sides. There's many sides to me. There's the activist side there is the mother and the grandmother, and then there is the community leader where, you know, where there's people that uh, I have to consider in all of my actions and in everything that I do and in everything that I say, because, you know, people are watching and listening. And so I was very surprised at, well, my initial reaction was one thing. But then, you know, as the time passed and, and I had time to think and to ponder about this tragedy that happened to um, Breonna Taylor, I started to look at the humanity of all of us, like even the humanity of the police officers that committed those atrocities against Breonna Taylor. Um, and I, and, and so I had to take a, a step back and, 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 and to look at what, you know, what is it, what is it about the humanity of a person who takes the life of another? You know, what, what is it that happened to that person? Because I believe that there's some victimization going on there too. There are some things that's wrong with the police and it's not just that they're murderers but there have been, these are, some of these are young men that have been taught from a very early age that it's okay to do that. And a lot of times they seek out positions where they can um, carry out brutality uh, because that's how they've been taught and that's how they've been raised. So I had to really look at this from a, hu from a humanity point of view because I have to teach young girls that um, yes, some police officers do kill, and yes, some police officers do murder, but in the bigger picture, we are all um, one human family, and we have to uh, find a way and find the empathy and the courage to, um, to reach across and reach past our own hurt and our pain and our prejudice and the stuff that we feel uh, and the things that triggers reactions from us to try to look at the bigger part of this. Because if we don't do that, in my opinion, where I am today, many, many, many more Breonna Taylors is gonna happen, many more George Floyds. It's just, it's never gonna stop because it's, 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 it's the whole of humanity, you know, it's, and we have to find ways to, to look at what we're teaching the police, how are we training police? You know, how are we profiling police officers? You know, what is the, what is the root cause of all of this? Because all of these things are symptoms 
of something much bigger than none of us have the answer to. I think all of us have a little piece of the answer, but none of us have the answer because we've not gotten there yet. We've not gotten to the point where we are ready as a, as a human race to look at each other and accept each other and embrace each other frailties, our weaknesses, our faults, and, and see ourselves in each other to the point where we are ready as a human family to tackle this problem. And until we do, we're gonna continue to see the killings because it's been going on for a long time. When I was 10 years old, I remember when I was 10 years old, this, this was going on, we was talking about the same thing. I heard it from older people around me. Police were killing each other. We were killing each other. Killing is killing is killing is killing. So it doesn't matter where the killings are coming from. We're just killing each other. So to me, it's, 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 it's about our humanity and how we treat each other and love each other. And are we willing? Are we willing? Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Akisha Thomas, can you jump in and maybe build on how you're seeing this? the um, experiences with black bruta uh, police brutality against black women and honoring Brianna and how it's salient with you, your work. Uh, thank you again, Dion, for uh, including me in this panel. <clears throat> yeah, I think about um, this case from a variety of, spec of perspectives. Um, I think, you know, first, like all the panelists, um, it felt so incredibly personal because, you know, here is a woman just, you know, alone with her partner asleep after probably a very long day who had goals and aspirations um, like so many of us do, especially at her age and to have her life taken away um, in, su in such a senseless way. So I think for me, it speaks first to the notion of vulnerability that Black women have. Um, in some sense, I think, you know, this also reminds me, um, and stay with me now, of Don Imus talking about uh, the women's basketball team at Rutgers and how he called them um, hoes and jigaboos. Um, and there is just historically this persistent theme of the lack of value of Black women's lives. Um, and, you know, that is just persistent. And so I wondered when I first heard about this case, um, would it reach national attention? Would anyone care? Would there be protests? Would there be arrest? Um, and would there be change? And you know, as we talked about before uh, the session started, I've moved to a new city uh, for a new job, and I that vulnerability just got increased, right? Because I'm. I'm an unknown quantity living, you know, in a rental house in a neighborhood I know nothing about. Um, and so there's, you know, ongoing vulnerability and isolation. As an academic leader, though, I also think about um, how this weighs on my students, Black students in particular, who I think carry the weight of stereotypes and stigma, um, misperceptions, social geography of race that says that uh, Black kids don't belong at research universities, um, and now they are burdened by, you know, killing after killing after killing, and who's going to protect them, and who um, values their lives. And then, as Ms. Campbell um, discussed, as an IO psychologist, I'm concerned about the organization of policing. Um, I think sometimes when I, I hear people um, calling for um, a protection of the police or, or further funding of the police, oftentimes it almost feels as though they are seeing policing as a calling, um, similar to a rabbi, a priest, or a minister. But I think being a policeman or a policewoman is simply a job. And if you um, drive through major cities or counties, you will always see signs for, you know, we are hiring in this police department. Um, and so we have to take in mind that um, police departments around the country are struggling. 
Um, and because they're struggling, they are motivated to perhaps not hire uh, the best folks to protect our communities. Um, and so I have questions about their selection systems, how they get evaluated, how they are um, promoted and developed into leadership. And then lastly, what is the culture of policing? And why don't we see more police officers speaking up when these crimes um, you know, come to the forefront? Why don't we see uh, police officers internally trying to make uh, systemic change, not only in the nature of policing, but how the community perceives and engages with the police? So there's a lot, I appreciate what you said. I took notes on all of um, the comments and there's a lot of comments in the chat that are really, I think, in, um, interesting and relevant to think about. Um, before I move to the chat, I do wanna ask one question that sort of ties together what you guys were saying is that, do you think there's a disconnect to what's happening in the police and uh, in terms of what's happening in the community around police brutality and women and particularly academic researchers and activists, do you think that they're building connections and what's working or not working to try and address the issues around the brutality against black women, both in terms of the police brutality, but also larger examples you said about stereotyping, et cetera, and how they're interconnected. And feel free to jump in um, if, it's, if anybody feels so. Yeah, you know, as a um, psychologist, I feel as though um, our greatest, um, kind of area of deficiency is that even in these areas where studying race is legitimate, um, that we often study it um, kind of in a vacuum. We're not really taught um, as psychologists, especially to think about the social and historical aspects of race. Um, it's almost as if people don't carry a cultural legacy or history around with them. Um, and that's, I think, um, perpetuated in the, some of our quantitative methods, our, um, compare, our reliance upon comparison as kind of the source of our analysis. I think as the academy moves towards greater interdisciplinarity, um, we are going to be improved by the conversations that we have with the historians and the African-American studies scholars, the women and gender scholars, the literary scholars to better kind of inform um, the questions that we ask, the types of analyses that we do um, and the ways in which we can then apply our work. Ms. Pamble, maybe you can comment on your relationship in terms of you working with the um, this on the other side is the community side working with the schools. Is there a disconnect that you think that's occurring there? You're on mute right now. Um, I was going to say that there's a really, really big disconnect uh, of, as to what's going on in the school system. And, you know, I don't like to point fingers or blame. But the, you know, a lot of the girls that we work with uh, at Girl Power that come to us, most of them through the school system, some of us through um, uh, JSD, the Juvenile Services Division. And what, what we're seeing is the, uh, the harm, the harm that has been uh, done to these girls, sometimes in the school system, uh, because uh, they just don't know. And I don't know if, the, and I, I don't think they have the resources. I, I don't think they have the resources. I don't think they have the training. Um, it's just not there for them. It's just not there for teachers. Um, and a lot of them come with their own prejudices about the kids in their classroom and, and who they are and where they come from. And so there's just so many disconnects at the, at the school level. And I think that's one of the areas where if we could concentrate on providing more uh, sensitivity and training to teachers because kids, that is a time when kids spend most of their, soup, that's when they have the most supervised time. So this, this seven, eight hours a day is an opportunity for uh, teachers in the social studies class, 
in language arts, in PE or whatever the subject is for teachers to, um, to receive training on how to implement uh, uh, sensitivity towards girls so that they don't end up in the school to prison pipeline because that's where it starts. Most of the girls that are ending up in the juvenile justice system, in prisons, it starts in school with the school suspensions, with the school expulsions, uh, sending kids from their home school to a uh, alternative school miles and miles from where they live, uh, extra travel, extra burden on the parents. Um, so th there's a big disconnect in the school system and, and, and we work with the school system and we are there to support the school system. But that is, that is where it starts for a lot of girls, especially the ones that we work with that we call at promise girl who we used to call at risk girls. But we had to change that into a positive and start calling these girls at promise because they do have promise. These girls are brilliant. These girls are smart. These girls are so resilient. You wouldn't believe some of the ideas that they come up with. They have business ideas. They want, they have aspirations, but sometimes they get cut off at the knee in the third grade, in the fifth grade, in the sixth grade, and definitely before they leave middle school. That light is, is gone forever. Dr. Panoram, I actually had wanted to direct this next question at you as I think Dr. Thomas brought up a good point about how this is part of a larger legacy of stereotyping and has implications in how research is impacted and then even changing the language around how we talk about black women and um, for example, at promise, using that term at promise and the idea of changing the ways we give meaning and create fact around black women as a protective means eventually against police brutality and other negative outcomes. But you said something that was really powerful that facts don't matter anymore and that there's a lot of the impact of the media and education. Can you comment, I know this is coming out of the book, can you comment on the importance of thinking about the media and how we give language and meaning around this to sort of, and how it's impacting what's happening with black women and also its long-term implications? Absolutely. And I think at least what I've learned from my students, especially coming off of the summer that we had with intense protests and, and discussions about race and policing, is that no one lives in a bubble. And so I think that these conversations, the students enter the classroom with them, I enter the classroom with them, they have to be addressed and we have to be critical consumers of news. And so that's what I was trying to get at with this idea that facts don't necessarily always matter in this moment. And how can we sort of engage the news, and then also offer and create our own narratives at the same time. Maybe to go back to the original question you asked though, because I've been thinking about something that both Dr. Thomas and, and Ms. Campbell put on the table. You know, starting off the school year, especially you know, in a couple of months ago, there were just increased calls to diversify syllabi and increased calls to think more critically about what we're presenting to students. And I've been thinking now that the semester has sort of come to a close, how important that is to do at every single moment to be asking instructors of all ranks to be thinking about what it is they're offering up to their students, which histories they're engaging. But I've also been thinking about the flip side of that. And, and this goes to something directly what Dr. Thomas was talking about a moment ago. Not everyone is equipped to teach certain subjects. And so I don't necessarily think after a semester long session of teaching that adding you know, works by people of color and black people, that that will be the solution in and of itself. And I've been thinking a lot more about you know, what is the role of interdisciplinary departments to sort of step into that uh, role of, of Cor corrective role in some ways, but also, you know, how can the university provide structures that will then equip instructors who do want to make changes to their syllabi and do want to change the, the histories that they're presenting to their students? All of that is, I think, needs to be on the table. And on the one hand, I think universities need to look outwards to bring people in who are trained to do this work. And at the same time, they've hired people into interdisciplinary departments like Black Studies, Women's Studies, et cetera. And I think that there should be an invitation, not an ask, an invitation for those scholars to join these conversations if they feel so willing. I think, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading the chat and there's a lot of comments about uh, 
making change as a culture by starting with their educational system and the people like the at Promised. Um, they also, the comment that moving away from the white comparison is critical, the comment by Dr. Thomas that was brought up here. Um, but there's a couple of, imp one person said then, and I hope I'm reading this question here, is they brought up the issue is how do we get long-term and long-lasting change by to bring people in, particularly as it relates to the ways in which Black women are being brutalized by the police and these longer stereotypes and frameworks about Black women that are uh, impacting these outcomes. What are some suggestions that you think can have a long-term? I, I agree with you, Dr. Panoram, that right now we're doing these, changing the syllabus, et cetera, the sudden rush, but what can we look over in the long-term, which will bring me into the next question that was asked. And any of the speakers are welcome to jump in and give their suggestions of what they think are long-term efforts to build on some of the things you've spoken about. I, the, the one thing that, you know, I have all these questions and I'm gonna tell you, I have more questions than answers. Um, I have this burning question and I don't know if it's ever been done. I've never seen it. Maybe I just haven't read enough, but when we, when these, when police brutality happened, I don't know if there's been a, a, a real sit down chat with the police officer. Like, you know how we drill black people and especially black women on everything. Why is this happening and how does this affect you? I have not seen that done with the police officer. Like what is in this person's head? That's the part that we, we don't know that we don't get that we haven't gotten to like and, not, and they are not required to answer these questions. They lawyer up, they get attorneys, they get the police unions and they get protected, but, and then they put them back on the job and they go and they do the same thing over and over again. But at what point uh, does this system sit this person down and get what's in the head of this person? Because something is in this person's head that we haven't been privileged to, and they never get to answer the question. You know, when a girl gets suspended from school, they call her into the principal's office, they drill her, they ask her all kinds of questions. But when the police kill someone, do we ever get an interview? What happened? Why did it happen? What were you thinking? You know, what, what is it? because I, that's the part that I'm not getting. Like, why can't that happen? It, it really needs to happen because for me, that's part of the, the missing piece of this puzzle. Like what is in this person's head? What is triggering this? What are those triggers? And we just, we don't, we, we don't have the answers. So a lot of work, a lot of the work that we do, we're doing it sort of in the dark, in the blind because all of the work is about the victims and those of us who feel uh, a need to uh, provide answers and solutions for the police brutality against black women, against black people, against brown people. Uh, all of the research is, is coming from that perspective, but I just haven't seen the research on police officers and what's in their head and what's called, I mean, we have a pretty good idea, but we don't, we don't really know. I just- Somebody want to jump I wanted in and to comment share about that. that? I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I wanted to share that. Yeah, I think what's in um, police officers' heads is not any different than what's in the dentist's head, the, the head of the teacher or the mayor or the, the neighbor next door. Again, I, I think you know part of this goes back to um, you know they're they're not people being called on high to serve in this way, so they are vulnerable to all the same implicit biases and stereotypes that we are all you know vulnerable to, and so it becomes the responsibility of local government and um, the police departments and themselves to address that during the training to have ongoing evaluation um, and support 
for officers to rid themselves of these biases. I will say that after an officer has um, discharged their weapon, um, <clears throat> and this may be more so in major cities, there is usually a psychologist um, sent to the scene to immediately do a clinical interview with that person. But that interview is more about the trauma for the individual officer than what may have been the motivation for you know, discharging his or her weapon. Um, so I think that's an important, important insight to, to consider. I think if you, you know, listen to the journalism surrounding some of these events, um, oftentimes you know, their story might be different from the story of, of witnesses who we know are not always reliable, um, as well as the target. So it's a complicated situation. I do want to point out, I see in the chat about um, the importance of leaders speaking up and being persistent and not accepting this as the status quo. If you will recall after um, Mr. Floyd was murdered um, in Minnesota, um, the first person to really speak up and do something significant <clears throat> was a relatively new woman president of the University of Minnesota who withdrew um, the police from her campus, um, which was, I think, significant politically, but also financially. Yeah, and actually I was gonna say that somebody in the chat also said, what do you think the impact of not consequences? So exactly the case at Minnesota, um, the, the president faced consequences for her making that withdrawal, um, but also, what do you think um, are, is a larger narrative in particular as it relates to black women um, when they see that these things happen and how the media and the police respond to Breonna Taylor's death? The fact that it takes a long time for you know, some consequences or no consequences at all. What is the message and the impact of this um, for the larger community, but particularly for black women and young black women? You know, Dion, I think it's like I said early, earlier, just the devaluing um, of their lives uniquely as Black women, because even if something traumatic happens to us, um, we, you know, really don't get the attention in the same ways that our male counterparts will receive. Um, I really encourage um, everyone to uh, read the Georgetown Law Center's uh, report on girlhood Interrupted, um, also co-authored by a, a bulldog, Dion uh, Jamila Blake. Um, in that report, <clears throat> they talk about the adultification of Black girls, that by the age of five, the broader society um, does not see Black girls as innocent. Um, they are perceived as not needing protection, as being more worldly. So already they've you know, been kind of saddled uh, with adult expectations and um, just garbage, honestly. Um, at the, you know, that's kindergarten. Um, and you know, there's just, I think, persistent themes as these girls grow up um, in school settings, we know that they are more likely to experience social distancing which actually was a thing before COVID. And what I mean by that is that they are more likely to be excluded. Um, they are more likely to be on the periphery, especially in more integrated settings. It's especially the case for black girls in white suburban communities where they're, again, uh, the boys are embraced, but the girls are somehow an outcast. Um, in health settings, mental health set settings, detention settings, um, they are treated, I think, more harshly, more likely to be medicated, more likely to be re restrained than their white female peers. So along the lifespan, we see the, um, the dismissal of Black women's lives, even as five-year-old girls. I appreciate, Dr. Um, Panoram, you have something to say? You were going to, you're on mute right now. Sorry to cut you off. 
I, I would wanted to add to say that Monique Morris's work in Push Out has been really helpful for understanding the ways that Black girls in particular are criminalized in school settings. But to your earlier question, I think Breonna Taylor's murder resonated in the particular way that it did because her life only mattered when she came into view in her death. And that's really troubling to think about the fact that she was killed in March. And again, public interest in this only emerged after George Floyd's killing in May. And then again, a couple months after that. And so we have to be asking these questions. What does it mean that Black women's lives only come into view at the moment of their death? And how do we reckon with that? And I know this relates to larger things, larger campaigns like saying her name, for instance. I think you brought in your, your you segued perfectly. Thank you into what I was going to read. One of the comments is um, that was uh, posted here. Given the brutal death of Breonna Taylor and continuous erasure of Black and Indigenous women who face higher rates of violence, do you believe that Breonna's murder is being exploited? Or maybe why is she um, suddenly the showcase example? Even though we know, and this is not to take away from her death, but we know this is something that's very much. Um, unfortunate epidemic of Black women and Indigenous and women of color um, exp exp experiencing high rates of violence and discrimination. Why do you think hers particularly was powerful and is it being exploited? And someone else made the comment, yes, Brianna's murder happened prior to George Floyd and nothing was done until after his murder came to light. I think in some ways, um, Brianna herself um, presented kind of a counter narrative to our cultural stereotype of Black womanhood. You know, she was gainfully employed. Um, she had aspirations, I think, of going to nursing school or medical school. Uh, you know, she and her partner, I think, were you know, saving for a house or something. So in some ways, I think, you know, especially for the more progressive um, among us, she may have been the, the model that they were searching for. Um, you know, which I think is, you know, counter to historically what um, some of our more conservative friends have, you know, and I'm older than everyone, I think, on this panel, but I remember, you know, the Reagan years and the presentation of Black women as always, you know, single mothers living off of, you know, public assistance, uh, the Moynihan report that, you know, said that the problems with the black community are, you know, traced back to the absence of men. Again, the, the valuing of men over the, the place of women. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, she was counter to all of that and someone who could be embraced almost in a her heroic sense. But I think we have to be mindful that, you know, not all of us are at that place where you know, on a path to it, and you you don't need to be, you know, a saint or to be canonized to, to live a protected life. No, I think that's very powerful because I want to highlight it's one person in the um, in the comments, but speaking of intersectionality, the majority of police incidents with black women are not in the public view. And those with marginalized identities such as low sex, um, socioeconomic standard and transgendered are less likely to become known. And particularly transgender black women experience some of the highest rates of um, homicide and police brutality as well. So I think you're right, the respectability politics came into play. Uh, and this is not again to diminish Breonna Taylor's, but it's interesting how that played out as well too. Um, one of the people in the panelists asked if you could make one policy change to make a difference in the lives of black women and women of color, particularly as it relates to this issue, what, um, what do you think this would be? What would be an important policy or an area to address to bring change about with black women's bodies and in police brutality and other forms of violence and stereotyping?
I know that Brianna's law was passed in Louisville um, specifically to address no knock warrants. And I do think that's something that since that law was passed, now the state is trying to get the state level. And I think that's one thing that should be on the table as we think about larger policy changes such that an incident like this would not happen again. Could you share a little bit what Brianna's law is? Brianna's law was meant to um, essentially ban no-knock warrants, um, the thing that the police did not have in order to get into Brianna Taylor's home. And so in the months that followed her murder, uh, people in the community rallied for that in particular. And it was passed at the local level, but now there are calls for it to be amplified at the state level and then across the US. And so I think that's one place to begin. And we can, we can see how that's already been implemented. What about within the educational system or even within the police? Do you have any comments, Dr. Thomas, Ms. Campbell, about policy or um, regulations of training that should be developed? Uh, for me, you know, um, there is um, there's the, the no child left behind. There is the three strikes and you're out. Um, all of these, all of these policies disproportionately affect black girls. Um, there is this school suspension policy that they have that disproportionately uh, uh, punish black girls more harmly than um, than anyone else. And and it's in a lot of this is in the inner city schools. And so um, the, the 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 school systems. The school system is like a continent and, and every school is a country and the school has a principal and the principal is the president of this country that make the rules for this school. And so they're all very different. And so we're, and, and so there's no um, continuity. Uh, and that's why you see black parents trying to take their kids out of one school and put them in another because they're be there's better teachers, there's a nicer principal, uh, they're not as harsh on black girls at this school. So there's all these things that's going on in these, in these communities where black girls grow up, where they live, where they attend schools, and it's not being looked at. Um, it's, it's really not. And, and, and what is happening to young black girls, and we see it every day, by the time they're in middle school, the light is gone. The light is out and sometimes you, you're not gonna bring it back. And then there's these other issues. Um, the, 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 the one thing that happened at Girl Power that we had really a hard time and I still get very, very angry when I think about it. And it is when black girls are victimized at school. Uh, we've had two or three black girls that's been gang raped in school. Um, nobody is punished. Nobody goes to jail. At one of the schools where there was a male principal, uh, the principal knew about it, called parents to come pick their children up and then suspend the girls from school. And so, and these are, these are isolated incidents, but, uh, when we try to fight against the school system, our hands are tied because we're in the school system. We're working with the school system. Um, and when you become this whistleblower, we all know what happened to whistleblowers now with this new administration, there's no protection for you. Uh, you're ostracized and you're isolated and you're kicked out. So for me, the school, is, the school system is where we need to start the training, the principals, especially the principals, it starts at the top because the, 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 uh, the behavior comes from principals who don't understand the damage that's being done to black and brown girls when they are sexually, physically uh, victimized, brutalized and assaulted at school and nothing happens. No punishment, uh, no one is suspended, but these girls, and we've seen these girls have to leave school, 
go find a whole different school because they're not allowed back on the school campus, especially if it's a boy who plays on a sports team and he's popular and the school is winning and the school has a great reputation for winning football games. These, there's, there's no action that's being taken. And the girl feels, uh, she feels like she, she has no value. Her family feels helpless because they don't know how to fight. They don't have money to hire attorneys to fight for the rights of their daughter. So uh, for, for me, if any policy would change or if researchers uh, could do anything, it would be to find a way to uh, implement training at the school level. And I'm not talking about with the, with the school teachers, I'm talking about at the, at the superintendent level at the school board level, at the, you know, with the principals and with everybody in that school, including the, uh, the janitors, because there's a problem in our school system where black girls are being victimized. They're ending up in the school to prison pipeline and their light is being snuffed out right at the high point of their lives. And they see that no one is being punished. And how does that make them feel? Am I important? Do I matter? You know, what just happened to me? No one is being punished. Mm -hmm. And so those are the kind of issues that we see that we have to deal with all the time. And it's, there's nowhere to go for help. I've been to the state attorney. I've been to the state attorney's office. Investigations go nowhere. You can't get any information. So it's just, it's just very frustrating. Um, and it's policies that's in place and no one is being held accountable. And uh, it's, a big, it's a big problem in our schools where black girls, uh, where black girls attend school. And so I think just hope something can be done about it. So thinking about that, like it goes into it, um, when we're looking at, are, do you think people are still saying her name? Like one of the questions we ask right now are, are people still saying her name or really focusing on black women's bodies and police brutality in the same way? And do you think this time next year, um, there'll still be this level of focus and understanding and discussion taking place on a broader level? I saw your facial reactions, <laughs> but maybe <laughs> I, if I, I'm going to tell you that, no, we are not saying Brianna's name um, to the same extent we did when this tragedy first happened to her. And, and, and I don't think that we can expect people to. We have tragedies, especially Black women and especially the black community where I work and where I serve, there's tragedies and, and situations happening every day, um, Dr. Stevens. Uh, we are in a pandemic. Um, there's a vaccine that's gonna be available soon and black women are afraid to take it and give it to our children because we don't trust the government because we remember what happened in the past. We don't have money to make ends meet. Our parents, our grandparents, they're dying without us having to say, getting to say goodbye. Our schools are closed. Our businesses are closing. Our children are home driving us crazy because they can't go to school. The school system has lost thousands of children and they don't know where to find them. Our president, our governor and our attorney general is crazy. So we, while we mourn the, 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 the tragedy and death of Brianna Taylor, uh, Black women, um, we have a lot of pressure on us. We, 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 we have too much pressure on us to answer questions. Uh, because it's one thing that we know as Black women, and that's no one is going to come and rescue us. No one is going to come and save us and our children. So we do what we know how to do. And that's take care of ourselves and take care of our children. Is, so, um, doc, sorry, I was going to say, we only have a couple more minutes. I was wondering if Dr. Thomas and Dr. Panorama, if you have something you want to add and comment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I guess I want to go back one question ago and just say we need more accountability. Uh, we have the data. We need to ask for that data to be available on a regular basis. You know, if we, you want to look into your school system, you can read a standard and poor you know, report on uh, achievement gaps. Well, we also need to know what the suspension rates are 
by subgroups within those schools on an annual basis, the grades um, in which those suspensions are, are happening and, and so forth. But you know, I, I want to agree with Ms. Campbell and say there's also a piece that I want to elevate that we have to break the silence of, around what our experiences are. I think within our families and our workplaces, we sometimes learn to silence those experiences. And by holding on to that silence, um, we're not able to enact change until there is this glaring example happen. So I think if anything, we need to feel empowered by this um, you know, awful occurrence to kind of speak our truth and hold people accountable and vote. Talking to you, Georgia, vote. Dr. Panorama? And to add to this and to your earlier question about, are we still seeing Breonna Taylor's name? I think the other thing we have to think about in conjunction with that is what are the ethics of saying one's name? I think about Breonna Taylor and the way her image has been mobilized. You know, the cover of magazines, people's sweatshirts, signs, billboards, um, and, and the way that evacuates personhood that continues again in her death to again, perpetuate repeated killings at a different level. And so, yes, I do think we need to bring her name back into the conversation in a way that it has been absented because other images and other things are coming to sort of stand in place. And then also, again, to ask to widen the names that we say, to go back to what we talked about earlier, the fact that trans people are being killed at a high rate as well. We need to continue to expand who we're talking about when we have these conversations. I appreciate it. I'm trying to see if that there's any additional questions. Sarah, do you see any additional questions that we haven't kind of touched on um, that we could include here? We have about three minutes left. Um, I've hopefully, I've, I've kind of integrated people's comments and questions into our uh, our discussion. Is there any closing points that you would like to add speakers while we have three minutes left? If there's something you'd like to leave us with, um, uh, be, I've shared your articles and your various websites, etc. But is there something you'd like to leave us with before we end this uh, uh, very interesting webinar? Um, maybe we could start with you, Dr. Thomas, would you like to leave us with the thought? Um, I think as Black women, we need to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves, but to also taking care of each other. There's so, been so many cases where black women are told and asked to protect black men, um, even when they might be the aggressor towards us, such as the case that Ms. Campbell talked about. Um, and we need to break out of that if we're gonna save ourselves, save our daughters and our communities. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Um, you know, for me, it's, I think I'm on, am I? No, I'm not on mute. Um, Dr. Stevens, I, I would just, just go back to what my thing is, and it is that we can never let murders, killings overrule the things that we know have brought us from thus far to here, and that is our perseverance, our compassion, our empathy, our gratitude, and our respect, and our grace, and, um, and because for me, those things always prevail and those are the things that I have to always draw back on. And so through, through all of this, we, we have to remember what got us from where we are, from where we were to where we are now. And Dr. Panoram, would you like to share? To reiterate uh, where I began, I think we need to be critical consumers of news. And I think there's a there's a way that this pandemic, if anything, has slowed us down and given us more opportunities, some of us more opportunities to engage in platforms like webinars like these. And so the opportunities are there. I think it's upon us, incumbent upon us to take them and, and to gather in the ways that would be intentional about how we gather is another way of putting it. 
I want to thank you all for joining this panel. And I think one of the things that are exciting, I'm not sure if you'll be able to follow, um, our panelists have shared information. For example, Dr. Thomas linked the article from Georgetown. Um, Dr. Panoram, they've, the article, The Push Out Criminalization of Black Girls, someone sent the link. So there's actually a lot of great resources in the chat right now as a result of the discussion of what you have brought together. So I appreciate you taking the time to share your words, but through being here, your words, you've also brought together more resources and contributed to the community in a very meaningful way. So I appreciate um, your uh, attendance. And again, if anybody would like to um, get in touch with any of our panelists or find out more, we've provided their links to their information. But Sarah, would you like to close us out? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And I can also, after the webinar is over, I will gather all the links from the chat and I'll follow up with everyone who attended today and everyone who registered but wasn't able to attend live and share all of those resources so they'll all be in one place. Um, thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Stevens, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Panoram, Ms. Campbell, um, for a great discussion today. We're going to be posting this webinar on SPISI's YouTube channel. So it's just youtube.com backslash SPISI, and that will be up within the next day or two. Um, follow SPISI on Twitter and Facebook to find out about all of our upcoming webinars and other programming. We also offer a ton of grants programs, which are great if you're doing uh, research on this topic or other topics. And thank you so much for um, everything you all contributed today. And I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you all.